Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. To the Hustle Nation. To the, to the Hustle Nation. To the Hustle Nation. To the Hustle Nation. Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we've got Mr. Jarrett Bush in the house. Very excited to talk to you, Jarrett. For those of you that don't know the name, Jarrett is investor, keynote speaker, motivational speaker, corporate team builder at Jarrett Bush Speaks Pro. And we know him in Wisconsin as former Green Bay Packer and more importantly, Super Bowl champion. Jarrett, mm. welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Dustin, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Looking forward to talking. Pleasure to have you. Pleasure to have yeah. you. I'm excited for the conversation. Certainly want to talk some football, want to talk some business, but I'm really important. Um, I remember when you came to the Green Bay Packers, and I would love to hear the story of Jared Bush and kind of how you came from maybe high school athlete to NFL football player. Yeah. So born and raised in California, the youngest of three. So I definitely... Um, you know, I took a lot of losses just in a very competitive family and very uh, educational driven, um, you know, from two from a two parent household. And um, you definitely got to see the successes and some of the mistakes from your siblings. And so I got to learn um, a lot along the way. You know, so my brother definitely paved the way. Being he, He's a doctor now, a cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, my nurse. No, my sister's a nurse uh, practitioner. Um, helping those patients. And so, right, very educational driven. So that was a vehicle for, for college. And I, you know, I def- definitely wanted to help my parents out there. And um, I was able to, you know, get a scholarship for football. I wanted to do track and football. That was hmm. the goal. And so um, I, have, I was torn between some schools because they wouldn't allow me to run track, but I really wanted to do football. But ultimately, I wanted to do both. Um, and so that led me to having that capability and capacity to, to do both. I think it, it definitely took that resilience and that work ethic to the NFL field. Uh, as we know, the USA track, track and field team is, is very dominant in this, in this country. And so, um, you know, the NFL was definitely my ticket. And so, you know, uh, 15 years later, I got my first shot at the Carolina Panthers being an undrafted free agent, which is uh, a very tumultuous moment because – the draft is such uh, an overwhelming experience. And I think just being grounded by your family is something that I would definitely recommend, you know, to somebody mm-hmm. entering to the draft because you could, you could be a second rounder and all of a sudden you're, you, you're, you're undrafted, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it can be nerve wracking. And um, ultimately I landed where I feel like the, the big man above wanted me to land because it led me here. And so, you know, I was fortunate for, I'm blessed for an opportunity for the Green Bay Packers to wear that G on my helmet and, uh, you know, found a home. That's cool. Did you ever think that you'd be living in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin again? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? When I, when I was released from the, from the Panthers and I was like, there was, my agent told me that there was, a, it was a toss up between Tampa Bay and Dallas and that determined on the uh who what team who had the worst record so that year the packers had the worst record i think they were like four and twelve and so i went to the packers and as i'm getting on the plane i'm like where's wisconsin (laughs) (laughs) and i was like well as long as they have a pro football team that's good for me you know and so uh you know as i was landing i was like man there's nothing but high uh, high low or silos and uh and farm fields so um you know but then I saw the the fan base, and the second to none, second to none. That's amazing. So you know, Jared, one of the things you you see a lot of successful people is the adversity that they have to overcome, mm. kind of throughout that journey, right? So every, everyone looks at you today and says, like, "Oh man, I mean, how do I be more like Jared?" Right? Mm. Uh, but you know, like you talked about being, you know, being undrafted, you know, candidly being moved to a team that wasn't very good. <laughs> at the beginning, right. Right. Uh, you know, there's a lot of adversity that you had to go through throughout that process. How how did you kind of continue to 
to show up every day and, and, and battle and have that mindset of, you know, continuing to overcome each of those, of those points in time where, you know, a lot of people could have just folded up and said, yeah, maybe this isn't for me. Yeah. That's a great question. So I was just really driven, you know, I was really driven to be excellent at what I was doing. Um, I knew that I had a vehicle. I knew I had a, a certain ability. And I I know that I had to hone that ability, you know, and, and just sharpen that ability. Um, and I need to be around people to help me do that. You know, I was fortunate to be around, you know, Brett Favre, Donald Driver, Charles Woodson. And those players helped cultivate um, that continuity and to em- and embrace that sharpening process because it wasn't always easy. You know, of course, right, if you stick a pencil, a brand new pencil in, the, in a pencil sharpener, it pretty much goes through hell, right? <laughs> pull it out. When you pull it out, it's nice and sharp and it's ready to go. And um, and able to leave a lasting mark, you know, writing on paper. So, um, yeah, through that sharpening process, it's it's tough because you have injuries, you have distractions, you have all kinds of things, right? You have the, the business side of things that that can really leave you depleted or deflated. But knowing that you got to put on that helmet and you got to bring life to a lot of people just wearing that jean that in that green and gold in that jersey um you know you walk into a lot of hospitals and people are are, are um not well off and so you're able to enlighten those people and make an impact by wearing that jersey and harnessing right and harnessing that that energy and that enthusiasm with that jersey and that helmet and changing people's lives that's tremendous Jared, yeah. when you're when you're back in your playing days and even going back as far as to college, what what's it like getting to that next level? So you, you give a lot of people who are gifted, who yeah. can, I would say, do the bare minimum and they can make it to the NFL. That's the super maybe elite one percent. Mm. Then you have the individuals who gotta work hard. And, mm. and then you've got everybody else who's got to work hard, grind every day. They got to do the little things like eating and taking care of themselves. Yeah. You know, wh- where did you fall and how hard was it to get from college or maybe high school to college and college to the NFL? Yeah. No, that's a great question, Chris. So the work ethic, right? <sighs> you know, to sum it up all in one and I can elaborate after, I think. You got to be able to do the things that people won't do. And until you understand, until you really embrace that, you're going to stay where you're at. Because, I mean, the, the competition is like that. Everybody, everybody's good. Everybody has, everybody has like, the All-American status. Everybody has, like, the all-conference status. Everybody has, like, the team captain status from the college team. But as soon as you take that, that step into the, into the NFL, everybody's done what you've done. In the sense of maybe like amount of yards, whether it's interceptions, whether PBUs, whether it's completion or, the, or amount of touchdowns at the running back, or maybe the amount of, you know, um, your your obsolete, you know, sack record. You just have a zero like shutdown like sack record, you know what I'm saying? In the sense of like a left tackle. So um yeah. So you gotta you gotta find your edge. Like what is going to separate you from the rest of the pack that's gonna allow you that's going to separate you from the rookie that just came in behind you, you know, um, whether it's your stamina, whether it's your strength, whether it's your speed, whether it's your cerebral ability to process information quickly and faster than everybody else. Um, right. Where are your relationships with, um, with, with your coaches? What's your, what are your relationships with your teammates? So there's a lot of variables there. That's a great question, Chris. And so, right. Do you get along? Do you get along with the GM? Do you get along with the head coach? That, that plays a huge role. It can't be important, Dick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, let alone the side, the, the physical ability just to play football. Like, do yeah. you get your comrades? Do your comrades like you? What about the training staff? You know, um, are you a good character guy? You know, are you a high effort guy? And a lot of times they, 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 they keep that very simple. Smart. Are you smart? Are you tough? Are you in the are you in the film room? Or are you in the, are you in the hot tub or the cold tub? Or are you you know what I'm saying hurt a ton? So a lot of, right your health right how well do you take care of yourself? A lot of guys right 
I started getting like you know physical therapists towards you know the middle middle of my career, uh, whether it's seeing a psychologist, whether it's just making sure that your head was on straight because it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster all season, and by the end of the season you're exhausted, you know, and whether it's physically, mentally, um, your family. Let's let's talk about that. Your family is all supporting you, right? So if you have a wife or a significant other, they're barely barely seeing you from six a.m. to about six p.m. Monday through Saturday, mm-hmm. and you might see them, you know, before you take off to go, if you're having a away game. If you have a home game, you still gotta stay in the hotel. So, right? And so there's a lot of it's, it's a juggling act, and you need a support system. So it, there's a lot of variables, Chris, in that that helps separate yourself. From the rest of the pack, from a, as an NFL player, um, does it take a huge work ethic physically? Yes, but there's a there's a whole lot of other variables that people don't talk about as an NFL player stepping into it. Jared, so so being a a star high school football player and being yeah. arguably a star college football player, yeah. um, when you were brought in, you were brought in to play special teams, right? When you came to the Packers, correct. So how hard is it? I knowing that that's going to be your role as someone who, as the kids would say, is him today. Um, and, you know, knowing that, that you have to do all the little things. Yeah. Well, you have to do all, you have to do, I mean, those, those little things are, are, um, magnet, magnet, magnetized or just, um, brought to the conscious in the sense of you got to do little things just to even make it, you know? Mm-hmm. Just being a good character guy, you know, and being a good guy. I can't tell you, Chris, the packet they sent to my high school was about this thick of, like, evaluations from, like, your teachers, um, what type of person were you, uh, all the way to middle school. And mm-hmm. my high school principal called me, like, hey, we just received a packet, you know, about your evaluation. And we filled it out. We sent it back because we thought it was just a wonderful opportunity. We were actually quite surprised how heavy it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, right and so i was like man i was sitting on the phone like wow they really do their due diligence on like who they're bringing in here you know yeah. and so if you were some smack off back in high school they're gonna know about it yeah right so a lot of a lot of kids don't really realize that what you do in your early years does play a role into your future and so it's you know we're not just being a broken recorder as a kid hey be nice to your teachers hey kids be nice to your parents because all that, all those character issues can either make you or break you sometimes. I mean, or not, you know, depending on how how good of a character guy you are. Ultimately, um, sure, does the physical aspects play a role? Yes. Um, but no, to answer your question, Chris, I think it's definitely something that you have to uh, be cognizant of. Like, I think the character and the behavioral issues probably supersede the, the physical abilities. Because if you're not a good guy. You know, nine times out of ten, you got to think like you're a highly paid employee. We want to know that this person's going to make the best decisions, even though he, he's a very talented athlete. And yeah. I think a lot of times, I think kids take that for granted. Like they can just be a jerk off <laughs> and think that they're going to get paid, you know, handsomely in the NFL and make not so good decisions. They want guys who want good decisions. You know, especially in that in that time of integrity, right? We all know, like at the at at late night hours, and you come up to the red light, like, are you gonna stop or are you gonna go through it? You know, they mm-hmm. want they want the guy who's gonna stop at the red light and then go when it's green. You know, so a lot of times, um, yeah, I think there is that work ethic, yes, um, but a lot of times I feel like the character will or supersede a lot of times the physical uh, aspects of football. One of the things you mentioned, which I, I is a great takeaway, is being willing to do the things that nobody else is willing to do. Mm-hmm. And so often, when we talk to kids or a, you know adults, right they they want the outcome, right. they want the success, right? But they're but it it's interesting because so many of them don't even realize that they're not doing that stuff, right? Right? They like as a as a leader of an organization, right? I, I, I coach a lot of our team. And mm. that to me is always kind of the intriguing part is as a, as a coach, you, you want to kind of shake them and say, but you want the outcome, but you're not doing any of the hard stuff. Right. And, right. and so do you really, I mean, everybody wants it. 
mm-hmm. but do you really want it? And so I'm curious, you know, in your travels, right? You clearly saw teammates that probably had a lot of the, maybe the, the, the hard skill sets, but mm-hmm. to everything you're talking about around character and kind of going that extra step, mm-hmm. you know, I'm curious as a teammate, how hard is that? Because, you know, I know as, as a coach, you, you see this potential in people and you, you, in some ways you want it more for them than they want it for themselves. Right. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm curious as, as a teammate in your travels, how, how did, how did you deal with that? And, and, you know, how often were you almost a coach of a, a teammate to try to get them to kind of unleash their own potential? Mm, mm, yeah, no, there was definitely a time where I, 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 I stepped away from that rookie green eared mentality and stepped into savvy veteran seasoned veteran. And so once I stepped into that, yeah, I definitely was a coach on the field, coach and player. And mm-hmm. oh, man, there was, there was, there were some really trying times because you really saw potential in the player and just quiet. He went about his business and he worked hard and I was like, man, I wonder why these guys not seeing the field. You know, and if you if you really sat down and you watched the film, like okay, like he just needs opportunity. It's not really anything that there's anything red flags here. It's just he just needs the opportunity to shine. You know, and yeah. he might he might just have a guy that's in front of him that's a Hall of Famer. Hmm. You know, it's nothing. It's nothing that he's not doing. It's a sense. It's a sense of well, he's just got a top of the line, top fuel player, like maybe a Clay Matthews sitting in front of you. Well. <laughs> At the same time, I think those those are the guys that you kind of just pat on your back. You know, you put your arm around, like, hey, you know what? Just keep doing what you're doing, you know, because not you know you got you got to break it down though. There's not too many there's not too many Clay Matthews or like Reggie White. Think about the guy who sat behind Reggie White or like Brett Favre. For, you know, like those guys and those guys went on to go play. And so I think you share those stories with those people because they can get disheartened because they know they have the capability of playing. Doug Peterson, he played for a long time. Tight yeah. depth play for right matt flynn he went on started got a great contract and so um you definitely just you know you definitely keep uplift up, uplift your brothers um the nfl is not for the weary and understand every year every year they're having guys purposely to replace you and so you definitely encourage your brothers that you can become close to because you want to go to the, to the Super Bowl, right? Ultimately, that's the ultimate goal, right? Super, Super Bowl bust. However, you do want to maintain those relationships. Those those relationships are vitally crucial to to keep mended and to continue to to foster along the way because it takes it takes a team, it takes an organization from top to bottom, from the GM to the garbage man, the garbage technician in in any organization. Um, and I think. You know, just having that support system, having your brothers, uh, creating barbecue opportunities to be vulnerable, um, to create that brotherhood really plays onto the football field. Um, and you and you have a sense of love, you know, and I think once you have that love of a brotherhood, man, that's that's when you really start to be dynamic. That's when you really start to be powerful. Um, and that's when the football really kind of just takes over for a lot of teams. Jared, you seem to have this figured out now as your, you know, post NFL career is is here. Yeah. Are you currently mentoring, coaching any uh, youth kids, players? I am. Yeah. So that's a great question, Chris. So I coach. I'm the sprints coach for um, my youth AAU kids team is the Milwaukee yeah. Speed Academy in Milwaukee. I coach the uh, Notre Dame track and field. Uh, Notre Dame Tritons here um, in Green Bay. So we are currently in pursuit for our second um, football one state championship. So we won won this past year, and um, yeah, I do the, I do the TV show with Brooke Griffin on Locker Room Live. So, but oh, yeah. the mentorship, yeah, that's definitely something that I love doing, and I feel like they they resonate with because I I relate so much because I was I felt like. 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was sitting in their shoes. And so I know exactly what they're thinking in the sense of like, all right, you know, let's do this. You guys will win. You guys are competitive. Well, I can't do anything with it. So now it's my turn to pass on that knowledge. And uh, I, I have a lot of joy doing it. Um, the kids that want it, the kids that desire it, I'm definitely willing to cut, you know, definitely go, go the length of whatever they want to accomplish. So, so with that, 
you're coaching a kid, whether it be track and field or football, mm -hmm. and you're mentoring mm -hmm. them. And yeah. they have these big aspirations of wanting to play at the next level, which for them yeah. would probably be college and then maybe professional after that. Yeah. What, what's the one or two things kids today need to hear from someone like you or from a mentor that maybe they just don't see, maybe they just don't know? Because I've got one in my house that needs to hear a couple of those things too. <laughs> oh, that's a great question, Chris. I think the one thing that... I got to say two things. It's got to be two things. Two things I got. One, whatever that they, they want to accomplish, write it down. And I always have them write it down and put it in an envelope and stick it underneath their pillow. And be specific on what you want. Because I feel like if you just say, I want a house, well, you're going to get a house, but me, you know, you're gonna, it's not going to be, it's not going to have a driveway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I, right, I tell them to be specific on what you want. Give a timeline on what you want. Um, how's it going to feel when, when you get it? You know, um, and then what purpose do you, are you going to have to wake up each day to get that? Uh, secondly, realize that they're going to fail. Be okay with failure. I think a lot of times we have a, we have a, we have a weird connection with, with failure, thinking that that failure is defining us. Oh, I fell in my hurdle race. I'm a sham. I'm an impot. You know, I'm I'm just. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do good. I was embarrassed by my friends, and I'm never gonna do hurdles right. So, um, just realizing, embracing failure, and I share a lot of those stories, and I think that really humanizes me a lot of times when I share that, and kids were like, "What? Like this guy, Super Bowl champ, just told me like he's just." brawled out on the one to the hurdles, you know, his, his junior year. Um, but I tell that story that I was ranked number one going to the race. I felt arrogant, banged the first hurdle, went head over heels, I was done. Uh, next year I went to state, placed fifth, in, you know, in the state. And uh, I recovered for that, redeemed myself. And so a lot of times just sharing that testimony of failure makes people a little bit more resilient when they do fail because they're going to fail. They're going to fail so bad. They're going to want to take, take off those cleats and want to throw their helmet down. They're going to want to, they're going to just want to quit. I was that kid again. And so we got to be able to relate to the student or the athlete in failure because whether I don't care if you're an attorney, or you're the president, or you're a gar your garbage technician, whether you're a maid, you've had some type of failure along the way. And so that resilience is really key. Um, that I would tell a lot of kids um, is to get up and get back on your horse. But that resilience is great. And kids, I think, are more resilient today than most adults. But I want yeah. to dive a little bit deeper into that subject because I think that um, you look at professional athletes like like yourself. You made it to the NFL. <laughs> I'm sure at that point people say, well, Jared Bush, he's, he's an NFL football player. Um, yeah. I, we expect this out of him or we expect this out of your teammates. But Everybody has a bad day. They have bad games. They have bad weeks. Even you look at some of the best players in the world, like an Aaron Rodgers, mm. they can and they will have a bad season. Maybe mm. bad for them is good for somebody else. But yeah. how how do you bounce back from that? Because you played in the NFL for 11 years, 10 years? 10 years, decades. So you've probably been a part of some really good teams that maybe overachieved or some really good teams that underachieved. How right. do you... Bounce back. How do you become more resilient? It's a really good question, Chris. Um, you got to love what you're doing, man. You got to love it. Like, I understand, like, if you're a sales guy, like, you got to love. So one thing about sales, like, I, I completely hate losing. I hate losing. <laughs> uh, full, in full, like, transparency, I hate losing. Probably more than I, than I love winning. And I know that sounds <laughs> interesting. Weird. So backwards, yeah. but I hate losing so bad, so much that I will go through the ends of the earth just not to lose. Yeah. That means going, I'm destined to win at one point, you know. And so, I think you got to have that passion. You got to have that drive, you know, that allows you to supersede some of those road bumps because you're gonna you're gonna go against them. You're gonna bounce against them, and so you got to be able to bounce back. Be intentional. And where and be full transparent. Look yourself in the mirror. Where can Jared improve? 
where can X and X improve? Where, what part of my game needs improvement? And you got to be able to have that sit down, be grounded enough to look at yourself like, okay, these are some aspects with, these are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. These are some areas where I need to improve if I want to go where I want to go. And so I feel like that with that intentionality allows you to um, improve. And I think once you have that little notch of the increment, incremental improvement, that gives you motivation and, the, and so on. You know, in each incremental improvement, you get better, right? Because you, once you get better, you like yourself because you know you're getting better. And like, man, I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I should keep going. You know, but at the same time, it goes back to resiliency. When you have that setback, you got to be able to have the passion and enthusiasm to kind of get back in it, you know. And um, some people are better than others. I can't say that all people are, are good at that because obviously some people quit. Um, however, that intentionality and progress is huge to build momentum. And how you do that, it's really crucial. Um, as well as the support. I can't, I can't, um, I want to highlight that as best I can. Having a support system having a certain environment around you to build that is crucial. I feel like you're a big byproduct of your environment, um, which I love about the Packers because every time you walk through the Packers, they have the greatness in those hallways. You have, you have Reggie White, Brett Favre, you have uh, Tony Cannondale, you have all the Packers Hall of Famers like, down a hallway just staring at you. Like, like they're literally like ghosts looking at you, you know, with their eyes moving. You know, which is funny, but, you know, there's a lot of great players that, that walk through those halls, man. So you're almost like, it just rubs off on you. And when you're in that environment, you're destined to have some type of success. If you don't win the Super Bowl, fine. But at least you're given the opportunity to be in that environment, to rub off on you, to know what it's like to be within greatness. So what's it like when... An organization has a couple of players that may not make great choices because in Green Bay, you're in a small town, smallest town in all professional sports. It's a fishbowl. Yep. Someone does something wrong, which inevitably happens every few years. Yep. You know, how, how do you make sure that as a pl young player or even a high school student, which I'm sure you deal with this all the time, kids yep. want to have fun. They want to be kids. How, how do you coach yeah. them and how, how do you get them to do that? Because my wife and I remind ourselves that we have a 16 year old and yeah. we have to let him be a 16 year old and make his choices good or bad mm. and learn from mm. them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's true. So I think, you know, to, to, to piggyback off that, like you got to let them make the mistakes and embrace those mistakes. A lot of times, you know, like for myself, I was, a I was a hard head. I had to learn the hard way a lot of times. Um, for instance, my dad, I mean, just on a small scale, my dad, I wanted to eat soda and Pop-Tarts before high school football practice. So my dad let me go out there and eat Pop-Tarts and soda. Man, that was probably one of the worst decisions I've ever made, you know. Because <laughs> after that practice, Chris and Dustin, I fell out. Literally, I had no energy. I threw my helmet off. I, was, I puked because I had felt like I had nothing in, in my system. And that was the moment that I had to... I had to take in. I was like, you know what, Jerry? If you're going to do this double sport athlete, you need to start eating a solid meal. And so that was on the smaller scale. And so, yeah, sometimes you got to fall flat. You know, your parents have to teach you or allow you to fall flat on your face. And that goes back to failure, right? You fail to eat the right the right things for what you want to do. And I had to learn from it. I had to bounce back. And so, yeah. Um are they going to make bad decisions, bonehead decisions? Yeah. Are they young, 22-year-old with a huge bank account? Yeah. Um, I think that's why you, again, you give them a support system. To your point, Chris, you got to give them a support system and some mentors along the way to show them how to walk and talk like a professional athlete. If they're not shown how to do that, who, who are you learning from? Other athletes in the league? Well, that's only, you're only getting a glimpse Maybe you get to talk to them during the, during the off season. Maybe you work out with them, but they're still only getting a glimpse. You're not really seeing. You're only seeing them outside the workplace. You're seeing them like in the workout facility. You're not seeing them within on a day to day basis, month to month basis. You know how they how they study film, how they interact with their family, how they interact with fans. Because the fans have to like you. That fan engagement is is, is crucial. And so 
if you're not making wise decisions on how you pick and choose and choose balance with interacting with fans, because I know a lot of guys have radio shows and TV shows, but then how do you balance that with the football, your family, and then the radio show or TV show? Well, sometimes you just don't feel like you know going out there because you're just so exhausted because you just got done running five miles and colliding with other humans. Let's be honest, people. Like <laughs> we're human. Like okay, I can understand that you don't want to do a radio show after you just collided head to head, you know, fourteen, fifteen times, and you just want to just lay on the couch and just be with your family and, and toss your baby girl up and up and down and and have a nice dinner. So having that balance, having somebody to kind of keep you grounded. Again, just having that mentor, uh, a support system around you to help you make those decisions. Because I, I guarantee, if somebody, if you don't have those things, I think you're 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 more likely to make a bad decision than not. Um, if you don't have that, you know what I'm saying. So it's really crucial to have those those important people around you, and the, and the Packers do do a great job of that. So so Jared, all those learnings, all those overcoming adversities that, that you mm. took from your NFL career. How have you now transitioned that into post NFL career? Mm. It was tough. It was tough. You definitely had to um, find your identity once again, uh, which was scary at the same time, pretty cool because it was like a blank canvas. You know, they, they kind of like, okay, you can't, you can't wear number 24 anymore. You can't wear this pack of G, you know, on the helmet anymore. So you find yourself to a higher calling, you know, and just kind of like Jay-Z would say, let me reintroduce yourself. My name is Hove, but I just kind of switched it to my name. Is and so, and I got to choose what I wanted to do. So I got to change that tenacity, that mindset and put it into the business world. And that's what I intend to do. Now, was it easy? No, it wasn't because it, you had to had to recultivate myself. I had to break a lot of habits, um, that and unlearn some things and reteach myself certain things. Um, for one, depending that you think that the Green Bay Packers that's the only organization. Sometimes, like I was, I was diehard. It was in the, still in the veins, and um, you rely on them so heavily, you know, and um, you really don't think sometimes there's anything outside of that, you know, and right. Cause you're so like laser focused on winning the Super Bowl, And then all of a sudden that's, that's done. So, okay. Now you gotta like, you gotta broaden your, your perspective, your vision. So what's really out here, you know, um, there's more to football out here. And so, you know, start picking up a few books and, and, and dived into the entrepreneurship. And it's, it's very challenging and very rewarding, just like football is. Um, and if you ever play golf, it's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. You can start off, like you might be hot one day, but the next day it's like, man, what the heck just happened? You know? Um, right. So I'm curious, I'm curious, you know, you talked about liking to win, but really hating to lose, which we hear from so many of the most competitive and successful people. Yeah. As you've, you know, reintroduced yourself right and and you know continuing to reimagine yourself and how how do you define that now how do you think of of that now because that you know football it's 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 obvious it's clear right like uh but in 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 entrepreneurship and business and all that it's 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 not as clear right it's it's hard to determine am i winning or am i losing so i'm curious just how do you kind of define that in your own head today yeah well, I like to always reflect and see if I'm improving in certain areas. Um, I think, you know, definitely just still having that tenacity, still having that mindset of a go-getter um, and just having that perseverance and that grit, that charismatic personality, I think definitely resonates with that entrepreneurship. Um, and how do I define that? Yeah, like what impact am I am I making? You know, am I am I making other lives better? Am I influencing them in the right way that seems deems fit for my strengths? And how do I strengthen those some of those weaknesses so that I can best model 
for the people that I'm influencing, right? Mm -hmm. We all have flaws. We all have weaknesses. But I'm always looking like, how can I, how can I better those 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 weaknesses, and how can I better highlight my strengths as well mm -hmm. to showcase what a high value man like myself look really looks like. That's humble. That's hungry. That's smart, and also resilient. Uh, and also has that hot, that higher calling, calling to action. So um, there are a lot of variables, you know, the definition. Um, but I will say that 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 any success or failure does not define you. You know, it's just can you keep going? You know, and it's about the journey. It's about the people that you meet along the way, not really the destination. So um, and I've been to some cool places, so I'm definitely enjoying the ride. <laughs> cool places awesome. like Green Bay. <laughs> yeah, but um, but right, like when we won the Super Bowl, like we got a chance to go over to overseas and uh, go to Jordan, go to Kuwait, um, you know, mm -hmm. ride on some really cool aircraft carriers and and meet some of the military troops, and um, all because we won a Super Bowl. And frankly, I don't think I would ever elect. I don't think you would, you know, Chris or Dustin, to go to some of the places. Um, I don't think you would pay your own money to go to, but I was fortunate to go, um, you know, for the Packers to, you know, and I don't even know where we were in the middle of the ocean. I have no idea. It's probably like, you know, classified information because uh, I want to say the Carl was the USS Carl Vinson was the same aircraft carrier that uh, they bagged um, uh, Osama bin Laden on. And so, oh, right. Wow. And if you can put that, that experience in the bottle i'm not sure who would pay for it maybe they would maybe they would but um business been to some cool places man um like i said the packers are a first class organization and um i you know it was definitely a vehicle to see the world from your time in the nfl what will you look back what was maybe one of the most rewarding moments now we know the super bowl might be one of the most exciting but yeah when you look back what was really rewarding about all that I think what's really exciting is the the common theme of football and communion and all the families that you get to bring together. Um, really, truly, as you, you know, because I feel a lot of times families, right, just like the teenager now, if you have if you have a teenager, really, they're they're like they want nothing to do with you. But for some reason, some reason, football brings them to the table and some food. Right. And so I, I'm really proud of of what football really does and brings people together all all colors right and so um whether it's international or here in the u.s people will come and fly to see some football and i love that aspect how everybody can come together and be so rowdy <laughs> and so intoxicated but still so friendly and love <laughs> football can't forget about that part intoxicated, especially in Green Bay. Hey, that's part of it. <laughs> and we appreciate it as players because you guys get louder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always love to see when a guy jumps in the stands. Uh, every once in a while, you see someone spill their beer onto a player and you're like, oh, yeah. boy. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's a good thing, man. It's a good aspect. I love it. I love it. Jarrett, you talked a lot about leadership and mentorship, both your time as a Packer, as a young player in college and that, um, who was your mentor? So I had two, three mentors. They were, first one was Burt Brown. He was a former, uh, receiver in DB, all state receiver. Um, very knowledgeable guy, right? They all played at a high level. Um, David Lawrence, Again, another you know Division One um, football player, um, definitely kind of showed me the ropes of where I wanted to go. And then uh, John Rushing, he's no longer on this earth anymore. Um, God bless his heart, but he, but again, a guy that showed me the ropes again that to take me to elevate. Had some uh, had some time with the Dallas Cowboys, and he had some time with the Canadian Football League um, to kind of show me those ropes, and and was really hard on me because. You know, again, I was one of those. You know, you're gonna you're gonna learn the tough lessons, son. And uh, 
So, yeah, they they were very influential. I wouldn't be here without them. I can honestly say that in full, wholeheartedly, that without those guys in my life, you would not be witnessing the Jerry Bush that you see today at all. Um, Because I didn't know better. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what the discipline looked like. I didn't know what the work ethic looked like. I didn't know what the character, the high character looked like. Um, I had to be shown that. I needed a model to to look after, you know, or to see, to to model my behavior after somebody. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that because if you're not shown what that looks like or maybe told or maybe just reinforced, I'm not sure anybody can succeed. I think in the military, right, there's there's one drill sergeant, right, for them to model after the drill sergeant or an admiral, you know. You see him with all his like decorated, you know, medals, right? Well, he holds himself to that, right? That, that utmost respect and that uh, utmost character, um, and so that's what you shoot for. And so, a lot of times, I feel like you need that model uh, to kind of look after, so that you know what it's look. Especially in the tough times, everybody can do it in the good times. But what what happens when in, when the when the bad times happen? Like, how do you bounce back? Or well, you need somebody to show you what that looks like, um, or else you're gonna go do you, you're gonna do that. You're gonna go a route that you think is best and is not necessarily in your best interest. So um, yeah, no, definitely that modeling is definitely a, a huge behavior influencer. Yeah, Jared, my final question. Very curious as a fan. During your time, the Green Bay Packers, you you had a, a good chunk of time in the Brett Favre era and the Aaron Rodgers era. Yeah. Who was the best locker room leader? And maybe it was for you in the defense, and and yeah. why? You said between Brett and A Rod. No, just in your whole Packer career. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's a tough question, Chris. I mean, or shoot. talk about some of your favorites. Yeah, there, I mean, there's so many because you have you have so many to pick from because you have. I mean, I just named I, I could rattle off a few. Um, you have the Donald Driver, you have the Brett, then you have like your Nick Barnett, who is like, <laughs> he's like, he's gonna walk in with his fro, boom <laughs> bop, loud, <laughs> you know. Uh, but then you have Fan favorite, yeah. But then, you, yeah. but then you have Jordy Nelson goes about his business, real quiet. But then his play speaks louder than how he speaks, right? Um, yeah. And then you have right. And then you have um, D lineman B J Raji. You got Clay, right? So you have a lot of different characters in that locker room, man. And and. Um, you're very fortunate, right? And then, and then you got Amon Greens. You have your William Hendersons that I was, I was fortunate to play with. Um, and Al Harris, you know, definitely uh, Charles Wilson, especially the way he dressed. Um, he made you feel bad, man. He made you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, you look at your jeans. He's wearing a full-on suit with the ascot just dialed in. And I was like, okay. You know, challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Mm-hmm. So, right. So you had you got to pick and choose and pull. What aspects do you want to you want to utilize for yourself? Which ones do you like? Which ones do you don't like? You know, and so um, those locker room influences, those those locker room chats are highly valuable. It doesn't matter like if you're Charles Woodson or the fifty fifty third guy on the roster. You know, the, the, that brotherhood was really important. So I can't just pick one, Chris, but it's a great question. Good. I, I love that. That's a great answer. Um, I, I'm going to ask you one more question, though, because I'm curious. Um, you were on some teams that um, made it very, very far in the playoffs, and mm-hmm. you're on one specifically that won the Super Bowl. So I'm curious, um, the year you won the Super Bowl, was that a year that the team knew that, like, hey, this is it? Yeah. Yeah, and it might do a good job manifesting that, man, because – the night what was it, the night before the Super Bowl. We all we all tried on and got our, our uh, finger sized for the for the ring. <laughs> and so, if you can imagine, that's really manifesting, displaying that 
it's already done. Like we've already won it. Like we're gonna go get our, our finger size for for the ring. And I thought that really placed um uh, a small seed in each one of our brains that we're gonna win this thing. We just gotta go and do it. You know, and uh sure enough, man, we did it because I mean and we, and we hit we we started striking hot at the right time too. I mean there's a ton of injuries. Chris, I don't know if you're if you're aware of how many guys were on IR. I want to say there was like ten to twelve, maybe thirteen guys on IR, and usually that's not a rest. Usually that's not a rest. Um, but we had that next next guy mentality up, and um, we went out there and balled our butts off, man. And very fortunate that Dom Capers called that play to get that interception in the Super Bowl. Because if he doesn't dial in that play, I don't think it doesn't happen. Is that the uh, one Nick Collins made the interception in the end zone? That was that was actually a basic call that we called most of the, most of the years. Fifty one hole. That was our that's our basic call. It's basically a run stopping defense. Fifty one hole. We got one guy a linebacker as a rap player in the middle. He's the free safety in the deep middle. Let's go play football, man to man. There's there's, no, there's nothing sexy about it. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Now that was the same game where um, Charles Woodson got hurt. Now, did that mean at that point when he went out of the game with a broken collarbone that you were the next man up? Correct, correct. So technically, I was the dime that shifted me into a nickel position. So when there's when there's six defensive backs, when there's four receivers, there's six defensive backs. When there's three receivers, there's five defensive backs. If that's if you can do the math. Um, so basically that puts you in any type of slot scenario, you know. Um, but yeah, no, it, that was that was a tough time to see, see your brother go down. Normally you see Charles Wilson, like he, you know, if he die, he lays out. Normally you see him pop back up, you know, he's he's ready to go. But then, you know, you see him, you know, wincing, you know, on the ground, you're like, oh shoot, you know, you never like to see your brother go down. Um, you think you think it's you know. It's not as it's it's more serious than maybe like a bruise, and so you know you really feel bad at the time. However, you gotta recognize and acknowledge the moment. This is this is the Super Bowl, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you don't get the opportunities, so let's go win this for him. You know, I think Donald Driver went out with the with the sprained ankle too. Yeah, uh, I think you're right. Yeah, so there are some. Yeah, even though it's Super Bowl, you know, guys were still getting hurt. You know, so but. My mentality was like, I didn't come this far to lose. I did not come this far to lose. There's no way nobody's going to take this from me or from us. Because, man, if you think about it, we we got close in 07, right? I feel like we got we got robbed in 2009 with Carlos Dansby um, at the wild, in the wild card um, championship round. And then 10 finally punched our ticket. Hell of a story. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Jared, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed the conversation. Before awesome. we let you go, uh, tell our audience a little bit about what you have going on right now and where they can find you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Blow Blow Dry Bar, high quality product offering high convenience. It's for the lady, just needs some self love, come in and rejuvenate, rejuvenate herself. Um, she doesn't want to do their makeup. She doesn't want to do her hair, mainly for like weddings, events, could be pre-appointment, uh, work meetings. And, uh, you just want to look and feel your best walking out of there. My motto is you look good, you feel good, you play good, you get paid good. So we make hair done. We do extensions. We do makeup applications. Uh, you get priority booking online. So you don't have to, you don't have to call, just, you just book online and we'll come in, make you feel like a million bucks when you walk out. All right. Well, thank you so much for all the listeners out there. We appreciate the downloads. We appreciate your ears. Until next time, peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level.
Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.